Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series, your resource for the latest news and updates on pressing issues facing the accounting profession. Good afternoon and welcome to the 100th episode of the AICPA Town Hall Series. It's been an amazing journey from our home offices three years ago to today, having the 100th edition here live at Engage in Vegas in this large MGM studio. So Barry, Lisa, hi, I'm, I'm Eric Auskerson, uh, one of the hosts for today, and with Barry Melanson and Lisa Simpson. And in March, in April of 2020, you know, the, the bell was rung, the profession was called. We launched this town hall to really have that dialogue with the trusted advisors that really stood up and helped businesses going, keep businesses going in America. And here we are three years later in every couple of weeks. We've got plenty to talk about and it's just fantastic being with the AICPA town hall community. That's right, Eric. You know, I, I, I always say the two takeaways I have in this process is that um, you, you started it off talking about the COVID environment and, and how the, the profession really responded to that. There'll be a lot of history books written on COVID and there really should be a chapter about that trusted advisor role in those history books. There probably won't be, but the, the, in, the impact that really CPAs had on those 6 million businesses that most of those programs were targeted on. And, and you know, as we look back, how our economy performed during that time had an awful lot to do with that. And I, I, I try to remind people in the profession that we should feel all feel just fantastic about it. And, I think the town hall did contribute that to, to the uh, sort of the, the pace and the change of it. And then the second takeaway is celebrating 100th is just how things, as fast as they were going before COVID, how they have even sped up in all aspects of society and tax law and services and business and economies um, that really fills these hours, you know, every two weeks, um, really to the full extent, sometimes overflowing as far as the topics. Those are really the two takeaways that I take, uh, I have. I think my takeaways are um, two. First of all, you probably heard me say, if you've listened to, to very many of these, it takes a village. And this town hall has really created our village. And I've learned so much from you. You guys feed me intel. You give me questions that the, we then go and use our other resources to, to find out some answers to and to come back to you and sometimes and say, I don't know, but we'll keep working at it. <laughs> um, and then I think the other is just the, the power of collaboration and expanding your networks. I've been able to work with teams within the organization that I hadn't very deeply before. I've worked with Eric and very much more closely, but also just working with other stakeholders in the profession. So it's been an amazing opportunity to, to connect at a deeper level. Well, Lisa, you know, talking about questions, we put some stats together. So over 50,000 questions have been submitted. We love the questions. You know, many, many town halls having over 500 of them. They help us really understand what's going on. And it's a live show and we, we give you our best available information. Close to a million, 800,000 live on demand participants over the past three years, high growth, and today it seems even as valuable, if not more valuable than it was when we launched it. Lots of town hall community reflections, just highlighting a couple here, uh, a very loyal uh, participant, Erin uh, Kerer here. She's attended at least I think over 90 town halls, 90 of the, of the 100 town halls. We're providing many of the engaged attendees town hall shirts and, and other uh, items to kind of just uh, help you, uh, you know, highlight your participation and your involvement with our community. So we've got a couple of things that we want to announce today. First off, one thing that we're going to do is we've heard from many firms and companies, uh, the CPAs that are attending, that they have colleagues. They have colleagues in their practice or at their company who would also like to attend 
So we're going to provide you the opportunity to gift a one-year subscription here to the AICPA Town Hall. We're going to be sharing the details on how to go about that in next week's newsletter. Here are some of the specifics, but we think this is excellent because we know that there are non-AICPA members that are out there uh, that would like to participate and we want to make that possible. So here's the lineup for today. We've got a, a, a full show. We're going to kick off talking about what's going on in DC. Then we're going to have a great innovation and emerging technology discussion with Kimberly Ellison Taylor. And then we're going to have an important leadership discussion uh, with Alex Dorr and we'll close with our open forum. So Barry, here it is three years later and we, we got bills being passed. Uh, so last week we finally got uh, the debt ceiling uh, bill through uh, Congress and signed by the president. Uh, so maybe give us give us the summary and a, a few of the key takeaways. Yeah, you know, we do have a bill being passed, but <laughs> you know it's not a lot of them that pass. It's yeah. only about four percent, four to five percent of the bills that actually get introduced that actually become law. And and this one, you know, we we talk about the polarization of of our political process. This one you can put in the compromise bucket, and and like most compromises, every side is probably a little disjointed about it or not that happy about it. Um, and that's certainly been the case with, with this, uh, this debt ceiling bill. Obviously, we all know the president signed it and it's become law. And really, just you've all read a lot about it, but I just want to make a couple of comments on some things that, that are pretty important in the process. First off, this extended the debt ceiling in a little bit different way. It actually extended it to a date certain, not an amount certain. So date certain of beginning of January 2025. Of course, that gets us past the... Uh, election process of, of 2024. Um, it does it does put some work requirements in for certain assistance programs. That has certainly been controversial on the on the Democratic side, and on the Republican side, there has been some cuts to the IRS. That has been um, a bit controversial on the Republican side because there were a lot of members of the House that didn't feel like that went um, back far enough. I think I think a couple of key takeaways. There's a provision in here that hasn't quite gotten as much press, and that is that, that, the, that the bill requires all, there's 12 different appropriations processes to be passed by the end of the calendar year in order to avoid an automatic 1% cut across both defense and non-defense discretionary spending. So in theory, in theory, that puts a sort of a, a pressure point for Congress to agree to an appropriations bill or a timely one. Although by the time we get to October 1, I'm sure there'll be a lot of political debate, which could lead us to shutdowns or threats of shutdowns and the like. Um, but if, if it's not passed by January 1, that puts us in a situation with sort of an automatic 1% cut in the budget. So that, again, should put the incentives in place for people to see something to pass. I know a lot of our members, and in, in the last time we talked about the debt ceiling, a lot of people talk about the funding of the IRS, particularly the, the uh, customer service funding. There's actually two parts of the bill that affect that 80, the so-called $80 billion uh, funding that uh, came out of the uh, uh, in Inflation Act is, the, um, is that the 21, $1.4 billion of that is really taking away from the $80 billion in, in this fiscal year. Now, all indications are that will not be impacting customer service, taxpayer service, preparer service. That's the story. That's a... It's a relatively short time, you know, to the end of the fiscal year. The bigger number is 20 billion, so a total of 21.4 billion. That is not actually in the text. It's not actually in the piece of legislation, but it's one of those handshake deals. And the handshake deal calls for that $20 billion of the $80 billion to be used for, potentially be used if the, the budget office determines it, uh, the Congressional Budget Office determines it against other discretionary spending. And if you just look at the mechanics of that, that means that if, for instance, if there's a 1% cut of funding uh, because they don't pass the appropriation bills, this could be a pot of money that the Congressional Bu Budget Office goes to to fund certain popular types of programs, et cetera. So you could see uh, where this is going to continue to be a focal point in the appropriations bill. The funding of the IRS will continue to be a focal point. Because on one hand, if you're a person who likes certain social programs and there might be a cut to those programs, there's a pot of IRS money now that you 
might have an opinion on whether or not that should be going to the IRS or going to one of these social programs. On the other side of the coin, if you're a person that thinks that the IRS's 80 billion should be cut in some form or fashion, um, then, then you're going to want to see that not be allocated. You might want to see other compromises in that process. Um, two other things that I think are important. Caps were put in that process. Uh, caps sound good, spending caps. Caps don't generally work because as soon as those caps start to get hit, then Congress finds a way to usually enact against them. So it, it creates a, a fight issue in that space. And then, and then maybe from a tax practitioner perspective, the most important part, I said that it's a 2025 date certain on the next time we get to a debt limit uh, period of, uh, of, you know, a line of demarcation, so to speak. Um, the Secretary of Treasury of the day would be able to use emergency, emergency measures, as it's called, to find other cash flows to fund debt service for a period of time. That puts us into, let's say, the first quarter of 2025 when this debate will resurface. That's also the time when Congress will need to be debating the expiring tax cuts uh, from the Trump Tax Act, um, from the, from the T TCGA. And so it puts the sort of notion of, of debt limits and those expiring tax cuts into the same political arena, which will be interesting for us to be talking about on the town hall in 2025, no doubt. But that is, um, that I think is a couple of the major political aspects of it. Well, thanks, Barry. We've, the, Lisa, no surprise, we've already got a couple of Section 174 questions. So what, what's the status and uh, insights on repealing this? Unfortunately, um, adjusting Section 174 back to the prior tax treatment was not be, um, included in the debt deal. So there is no change in Section 174. It's still the one y'all don't like. Um, so we continue to push our advocacy efforts around it, but as we've been telling you for a while, it's, it's political and it's got to find the right legislative vehicle to get through Congress. So we're continuing to keep it on our radar. We're continuing to talk about how impactful this change has been on taxpayers, but we've got to find the right vehicle. So still keeping an eye on that one. Yeah, unfortunately, it actually is bipartisan support, it but it's, it's finding that one of those 4% that get through the process to, to get it enacted. Yeah. Probably means file and amend, as you said, so. Well, sim similar story here. Very similar. So um, we do have bipartisan legislation that's been introduced called the Red Tape Reduction Act. And one of the things this does is, enter is um, increase the 1099K threshold to $10,000 from the current $600 level. And, um, you know, it's, it's, in our opinion, it's a, it's a good solution. It's a balance between the 600,000 and the 20,000 that it used to be. Um, but again, we've got to get the right legislative vehicle for it to get attached to. Political, but bipartisan, it comes at a cost, so it'll get scored. But again, we'll continue to um, support the efforts to change that threshold. Well, Lisa, one thing that it came up a number of times yesterday in, in the booth as we were talking about the, the town hall was what's going on, status, and a lot of interest in the ERC. Yeah, the IRS came out again on May 25th with another warning to consumers and to taxpayers. An interesting tidbit, they specifically posted their comments to tax Twitter. If any of you are in tax Twitter, um, go tax Twitter. They've been a huge resource for me. Um, the IRS specifically mentioned tax Twitter to call their attention to this newest warning about the aggressive marketing of, of employee retention credits. So just telling you that, that they have said they are increasing their audits, they are increasing their criminal investigations, and they are, they are going in deep. They're asking for very specific details on how a company qualifies for ERC. So um, we'll, we'll continue to keep you posted on that. All right, one other um, technical update for you, and that is around um, a new, pro well, a provision that comes into effect on June, June 9th around um, data security. This applies very broadly, but it does encompass tax professionals, and it is part of the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act um, that was, um, 
introduced in 2003. But in December of 21, the Federal Trade Commission, um, recognizing the changes in technology, implemented some new requirements within the security plan. So we have a lot of resources available for you. And I'll actually say that the, um, the IRS publication that you'll find a link to gives a lot of good insight as well. So we've got resources that are on the site. We've got resources that are coming out. And um, just wanted to make sure that you knew about the June 9th effective date. Well, that brings our DC discussion to a close, and I'm thrilled to have Kimberly Ellison Taylor join us on stage. I know many of you know her. She's a former AICPA chair, also former Oracle executive, and staying very busy doing many things. And one of those is she's currently the Innovation and Emerging Technology Professor at Carnegie Mellon, and you're on a couple of company boards. So it's great to have you with us, Kimberly, and I'm looking forward to this discussion with you, just talking about innovation, the speed of change. So I'll let you uh, kick things off with this provocative slide. <laughs> Absolutely. So first of all, congratulations on 100 episodes. I am so proud of you and so proud of the attendees who have watched faithfully every week. The reason that I wanted this provocative slide is basically to say, during the last three years, we got our work done. We did a good job. Necessity really is the mother of invention, and we stepped up. But now we have to continue that momentum. We are in an environment of unprecedented change. And I know I could have said that last year, and it would have been true, and three years before. But the pace of change is only increasing, and our clients are expecting more. The benchmark has now moved, and we have to move forward and leverage innovation in order to help us do that. And one of the things right off the bat that when I look at this slide, I think to myself, how many of us are like Kimberly? We're innovative. We're doing the work. But are we? Do we have opportunities? And do we let innovation be a word that's only used by larger organizations? When actually I think smaller organizations are the heartbeat of our economy, I think we get the job done in communities and organizations and support the economy in big ways. I don't think innovation is just for larger organizations. I think this is an advantage and we have a competitive differentiator for business and industry, government, not-for-profit, consulting, education, and in particular, public accounting, client accounting services. So this says, keep our foot on the pedal, let's keep going, keep moving, and think about how we can do the services we provide in a more effective and innovative way. Well, Kimberly, th thank, thank <laughs> you. Uh, what we like to do in the town hall is bring practical tips uh, to our attendees. So let's talk a little bit about the what. You know, how, do you, how do you think about this? How do you, you know, get your organization moving forward? Absolutely. So from this, this slide, what I wanted to really point out is that strategy should drive the innovation. We should not, if you can imagine for a moment, a dog that says, wait, there's a cat. Oh, there's a squirrel. Wait, there's another dog. We have to be focused on our why and we have to be consistent with the things that we decided we wanted to be when we set up our firms. And so all of those are really great questions. I call them the big 10, and they apply to organizations of all sizes across industries and regardless of the segment that you're in. But one of my favorite questions is around competitive advantage. And you know when you have a competitive advantage, when you can charge more than other people. We can't afford to let our services become commodities. We don't want to be sharpening our pencil and people not distinguishing us between us and our nearest competitor. When they know the difference, when they seek you out, when you can charge more, that's when you know you have a competitive advantage. And I think the other questions still apply, but it still comes back to, Eric, in a lot of cases, transformation, technology, and talent 
is what I hear whenever I'm speaking with CFOs, CIOs, transformation officers, the students that are actually in Carnegie Mellon's programs. Everyone's thinking about these questions, and I think we have to start with these questions. Now, notice I didn't talk about technology because technology is an enabler. This is the easiest part of this discussion. Innovation is a strategic mindset. We have to really consider how we're gonna do these things as long as it's aligned with why we started the organization in the first place. So it comes back to the why. It's a strategic enabler that technology is actually gonna help promote and push, but it's not about blockchain and AI in and of themselves. And that's why I didn't mention technology on this slide. I don't want us to go down the path of thinking innovation means technology. It actually means a mindset of continuous growth, and it means a mindset of everyone in your organization is an idea leader, and everyone in the organization can innovate. Kimberly, I love these questions because they apply to CPA firms, they apply to business and industry, they apply to any organization. And I always look at the content you bring and think about how CPA firms can use these resources when consulting with their clients. So I think this is a, a great checklist of, of key crucial conversations you can have with your clients to get, these, get things started. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, Kimberly, just your, your last point there that technology is an enabler. We've got, we've got 200 you know, uh, companies here at Engage they're doing a great job building solutions to help transform the practice of finance and accounting. But it really is all about the strategies and intentional plans from the firms or from the companies to put those, those solutions to work. And that's, that's what we've really uh, come to realize at, at CPA.com with a lot of our different practice development activities. So let's now move to, we talked a little bit about the what and the strategy, uh, a little bit about the how here. Uh, as you think Absolutely. more about innovation. So if this is the how-to, so you're probably thinking, okay, Kimberly, we've heard pitches like this around innovation before. Where do we get started? Well, we have to start with asking ourselves, what logic are we using? And that's one of my favorite Peter Drucker quotes. But let's talk about how do you generate revenue? Are you diversified? Are six, is 60% of your business coming from one customer that only uses one of your services? If you're in business and industry, 70% of your business is through one supply chain, which is in jeopardy, as we know, because we're hearing about it all the time. When is the time to innovate around our revenue and profit models all the way across to when you're looking at the process? What processes would you do today in 2023 as compared to might be 1980 when you started your firm? If you are leveraging 1980 processes or pre-pandemic processes today, then you're gonna get behind. And it doesn't matter what size organization you are, it's because we need that continuous innovation that says what processes should be eliminated, which ones should be simplified, which ones should be streamlined, standardized, and then automated. And so when we talk about collaboration, where can you collaborate in a go-to-market model to be larger and present offerings that might be broader and service a bigger need than just you can do alone? You may not have the resources and money in and of yourself to do beyond your niche, but suppose two or three companies came together across a geography, across an industry, and then when we start talking about the experience, we're talking about the client experience and the employee experience. It doesn't matter if you're amazing and you're great, if your team doesn't wanna work with you and your customers find it burdensome. So where can we automate and where can we innovate around the experience to just make it a pleasant one? And so when we go to the brand, as we well know, if it's not happening on social media, then it's not happening. And it, yes, it's complicated and I know all the relationship statuses, but this is how we show up. And this is how people evaluate, do they wanna do business with us? Are we likable? Do we share their values? And this is how we can leapfrog. We don't have time to meet you. When we're talking about innovation, we don't have time to catch up. We gotta leapfrog over everyone else. And I believe that small firms, small organizations can get there just as quickly as some of our larger organizations. And in some cases, I will tell you, larger and faster. You can get there faster than them. Hey, Bar Barry, we're gonna kind of wrap up this innovation segment now, but maybe some 
close, closing thoughts for, from you. Yeah, I certainly agree with um, Kimberly's last point about smaller firms having certain advantages to being able to do more nimble type of activities in that space. Um, you know, the resources are the, are the, the other side of that equation. The larger firms have the, have the larger resources, but maybe not as much of a nimble. And, and that's, you know, I think the thinking of taking advantage of what you can. And I think if I go back to uh, Drucker's quote, I, I really think when we look at firms and the evolution of firms over the last couple of decades, and certainly as it moves forward, it's really those firms, regardless of the size, that really have taken a look at the things that are happening and changing that sort of logic, if you, you know, towards his quote, um, to make sure that what they are approaching as far as what's the needs of customers in the near term, et cetera, or clients, is really the key component of how you build those practices. We've seen it in tax practices. We've seen it in accounting and auditing. We've seen small firms specializing in certain areas of auditing do that extraordinarily well, extraordinarily efficient. And I think generally, when we talk about the technology implications, sometimes our profession gets a little bit of an unfair stereotype on how we embrace technology. The, the reality is, is our profession has embraced those technological changes very aggressively. Yes, there's examples in our profession where we don't. But more than likely, you will find our profession embracing those technological changes um, as users, as people who sort of make them come to life in the marketplace. Um, and you can go all the way back to the introduction of the microcomputer in 1980, and I can give you <laughs> examples of that process. And so I think we have to have a confidence in doing that as far going forward. Well, yeah. the thing that, yeah. Can I jump in for just a Absolutely. minute? Absolutely. Because this is just such a perfect setup for a resource set that we've just launched. Um, PCPS has um, made available on its site now a strategic planning toolkit for firms of all sizes, and it uses the, the strategic planning model of Tom Hood and the Business Learning Institute to guide you through those strategy questions that Kimberly talked about in the beginning, and, and these are designed to help smaller firms have access to the same insights and, and thought leadership that all firm sizes need. So it's just, it, it hits on all of these. It's perfect setup. So thank you. Well, thank you. And we, this was a little bit of our innovation and technology section of today's town hall. One thing that we're talking a lot about here at Engage is generative AI and chat GPT and what that means to the profession. We had a great segment on that uh, a few weeks back. More to come on the town hall, but Barry, that's, that's the next big uh, technology trigger uh, that's gonna move society and the profession and everybody forward. Yeah, and I'll just say, because there's been a lot of press, ChatGPT did not take the CPA exam. <laughs> okay. So that is just not the case. It, 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 took, it took a portion of the exam. <laughs> no, it did it, not. It, it took, it, it it took it. exam <laughs> questions that are out there that are part of the prep stuff. It did not have and does not have access to the actual CPA exam. So as you all know, we keep moving. To, town halls are all about many different segments. We're now going to move to <laughs> a great discussion on leadership. It kind of helps bring together you know, all that we're talking about, innovation, understanding, regulatory changes, so how you're leading. So Lisa, I'll let you uh, introduce our, our guest here. Thank okay. you. Um, I'm happy to present Alex Doerr. Alex is with Reality Based Leadership, which is a, a company name I just love. <laughs> um, we started working with Alex a, a few years ago, and he was on a town hall back in August of 2021 talking about accountability and how to drive accountability at that point, we were talking about in a remote world. Now we've moved a little bit beyond that, um, but we worked with Alex um, at that time to develop some PCPS resources around driving this accountability and engagement. And um, I, I love one of the, the mantras of, of Alex's organization is, is eliminating drama at work. Um, we were at the town hall party last night at, at the CPA.com booth and one of the, a partner in a smaller firm had come up and said, you know, he had seen Alex's segment with us back in 2021 and had kind of started thinking through everything and realized, oh, I'm the drama. <laughs> I'm the one. <laughs> so Alex is here to talk a little bit about that as a quick refresher. And then he's going to tell us about some new tools that he's developed to help us modernize our leadership approach. Yeah, thanks for that that segue there. I love that uh, testimonial. Um, 
this session, you know, our, our research is all about um, drama in the workplace, and it's an untapped area that's not being talked about in the profession. And we found the average person spends two and a half hours per day in drama. And so we got work to do, but then this two and a half hours is thought of as the cost of doing business. If you have people working together on complex issues, and so we teach tools to help you quickly identify drama and then move beyond it to get back on track with intentional ways of working together. One of the sources of drama is lack of accountability, and that ties into engagement. And the big line here is in the workplace, the same behavior, the same leadership can't please a high accountable and a low accountable mindset at the same time. So you'll always be making one of those groups uncomfortable. It's our job as a leader to make the right group uncomfortable. So I hear all the time in the profession, we can't afford to lose anyone. And my response is, well, who are you losing if you are? Is it your high accountables or is it your low accountables? Much different turnover. So we have a lot of tools to help you reward your high accountables, keep them loving your place, and then they bring in other high accountables. And then you um, coach very clearly those that are in a low state of accountability up or out. And so it helps clean up your environment so it's a great place for high accountables to work that's low drama. And Alex, just on that concept, I mean, that's a, that's a key item to think about related to the hybrid workforce. It is. It is. I mean, one of the examples I share often is Yahoo in the 90s. Does anybody remember Yahoo? Mm -hmm. They had a, a team sneak out that was high performers in the 90s and started working from home, and nobody knew it at the office. Well, someone walking through the office went to get something random, and they didn't see them in there, and they got all offended. They're like, well, I want that benefit. I want to work from home. And so the organization panicked, and they're like, wait, we have a team working from home, but their results were incredible. So in the panic, they gave everyone the same benefit. Everyone worked from home. And then their results tanked. So then out of panic, they brought everyone back, and then the high accountables quit. They went to Amazon, Google, Facebook, some companies you might have heard of. So the, the high accountables wanted that differentiation because they were already delivering results. Then you give benefits to those delivering. You don't deliver results or benefits up front to everyone because then you have nothing left to differentiate. So that was a pattern I saw early on in the pandemic. We had to do it, but in your strategy moving forward, you want to think about what do high accountables want and need, and then what make sure you're not giving the same benefits to everyone because they haven't shown it yet. Yeah, you got you got to you got to think as a leader. You know who can handle the hybrid environment. And it's not can. performance. I want to say a lot of people are like my A players. I'll take a B or C player as long as they're low drama. It's a different metric, because I can teach them skills, and by the way, AI is going to take away a lot of those skills. I need low drama team players on my team. That's, it's about the drama piece, even if they're a B or C player. So Alex, as we um, were having our conversation and thinking about what you were going to be talking about and engage, you had just an interesting um, statement about leadership in the modern age. Mm -hmm. Leaders don't manage people. Leaders manage the energy of people. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so there's a shift modernizing your leadership. We don't um, manage people anymore or the work of people. That's systems, standardization, software. You want to standardize everything you get your hands on. We manage the energy of people. And whether it's just yourself managing your own energy or you have a small team or you're a huge firm, all day as a leader, you manage energy away from why we can't and why we shouldn't have to into what would great look like and how can we get there. So yes, there's work to do, but most of your role as a leader is should be taking the energy away from why we can't and moving it towards how we could. And our tools do that. Each one, we're going to show one here, uh, do that practically in the moment. So that's a, a perfect lead in because I'm a visual learner. And yeah. Um, yeah. Alex, you might have to give me a little bit more than these boxes. <laughs> yeah, to help me learn. So, so what you got? So, what I've been, as I talk to, um, no matter where everybody's at in their career, and we're across all industries, we've been in healthcare in the trenches in really, really rough situations. And what we saw is people that were suffering at work and burning out, they spent all of their time in two areas. Left side here, if you can pop this all up, Eric, or this is fine like this, arguing with an unpreferred reality. So it sounds like this, ain't it awful? Things shouldn't be this way. This is no way we should run a firm. Who thought of this decision? This is absolutely ridiculous. Anybody heard any of that on the town hall? So they spend time arguing with an unpreferred reality. Once that gets tiring, people jump to the other side that's the white box. It's called wishing for a different future, but taking no action. Sounds like this, if someone finally did something, that would be solved. Or if someone finally looked at that process and figured it out, we'd have it taken care of, but they take no action. If yourself or your teams are in those two spots, it leads to automatic suffering. And there's no hope there, there's no energy there. 
but there's this tiny space, the yellow, yellow bar there, but that's a bad representation. It's so small, you gotta turn sideways, suck your gut in and shimmy in there right now. But that's the space to add value. And as an, a, a CPA, as a leader, our job all day is to take, given that unpreferred reality, yeah, that's not ideal. I don't love we didn't get that information from the client or they only responded to one of our six questions. That's an unpreferred reality. What would great look like? We have the information. What's the next thing you can do to help us get there? Oh, you mean I need to pick up the phone and call them instead of just send another email? That would work. And so you, you have these coaching techniques that you do all day just to put people into the yellow. And that's where people have more energy, they have more impact, and they're able to get results quicker. So we're wasting a lot of energy not getting to the yellow as a colleague, as a leader, and this will free up so much more time. And then after you do it over and over, then people do it themselves, you don't even have to lead them anymore. Self-leadership. So let's give some examples. Let's talk through a couple of scenarios that, that you've- Let's flip over to the next um, yeah. slide or I can stay in here. So people come up to me all the time, they're like, I would have gotten that done, but there was competing priorities. And I start with empathy, not sympathy. Love first. Dang, that's frustrating. I get frustrated when I'm in the middle of competing priorities and something comes up. Given that, my favorite term right now is given that, given that unpreferred reality, we always have unpreferred, uh, or we have comedian priorities, what would great look like? This became one of the priorities, we hit the deadline. What could you guarantee next time to get us there? Where could you get better at delegating? Where could you get better at updating us? Where could you um, switch your work around if needed? And I got the person back in the yellow. Um, if we're gonna get more practical, my favorite tool for this is called thinking inside the box. So many people try thinking outside the box, and in my first experience, we got some big problems out there. I became a leader, and they're like, think outside the box and find something innovative to do. So I went to my team, and I'm like, what ideas do you got? We gotta solve this issue. First person raises their hand. They're like, I got an idea. We could hire five more people, and it's solved. And I was just in a meeting, and what was the meeting all about? Nobody's working anymore. We can't find anybody. So I go, no, not a good idea. What else do you got for ideas? And the person goes, I got an idea. We spent another 80,000 on the system and updated it, we'd have it solved. And I was just in another meeting, we have no budget. So the team all of a sudden is like, we give you awesome ideas, you say no to everything, and then I'm just gonna not play anymore, this is a sick game. <laughs> so what I had to do is go back and say, think inside the box. So what you do is you draw up the reality and the constraints. We have no more staff, no more money, we're using the current system, what's our goal? We're gonna get through this issue. Everybody think inside the box. So it helps you frame the input in reality, not fantasy. So I was working with a nurse leader. She wanted more sleep. She was burning out and she came up after and was like, what would you do about this? So I said, I don't think I can solve this for you, but I can help you think through it differently. And I drew a box. Are you game to play? She said, yes. I said, it sounds like your goal is more sleep. And it sounds like you just told me you work these 12 hour shifts. There's no time in the day you're working. You know, all the time, there's only 24 hours in the day. I drew the box just as you see it, and I said, instead of thinking outside the box, which leads to an argument with reality that you'll lose, but only 100% of the time, let's think inside the box. And she has the human condition. The first thing she did is said, go talk to my manager. These long hours are ridiculous. Why do we do this? See how that's outside the box? So I went, I said, I'll go talk to your manager. Where's she at? She's like, no, don't do that. Get, and I said, notice you went outside the box. Let's get in the box. And then got silent and jokingly she goes, could you find two more hours in the day? Can we do 26 hour days? And I go, I think we're stuck on this 24 hour time period for a few more years. <laughs> See the argument with reality? And then it got really silent and I was standing beside her and I kid you not, she looked at me and goes, poof, poof, poof. you're right, I could stop watching so much Netflix. So in the box I wrote, wrote less Netflix and now we're self-reflecting. She goes, actually after my shift or work, I get on the phone and I just doom scroll through TikTok so I could put my phone down after work and that would give me more time. And so at the end I go, which one of these do you wanna to commit to? And this is key, Lisa. The ego does not like to see things visual and then commit to it because then it's accountability. So it got silent. And this is a reveal that it might have shown a lack of willingness to actually go towards her goal. But to her credit, she said, you know what? I'll put my phone down after my shift. Now, my joke there is, what's a better strategy for well-being, putting your phone down after work or trying to change the whole US healthcare system? Now, I know we have some issues there, but, might be, but what might be a better start? Let's get accountable inside the box, and then funny enough, the more you think inside the box, the more you're a credible witness to change what's outside the box, because so there are issues. Alex, uh, just a great kind of example of kind of a, a, a way to kind of you know, think about 
uh, how to become you know, more productive and, and address you know, moving things forward. But let's just go back to this slide. There's a lot of, lot of questions that came in. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, surprise, surprise. <laughs> so one chat. question here is, a couple of questions came in related to drama. Here, I'll give it to you. I'm, I'm curious how Alex is defining drama. What may be seen as creating drama to one person may be communication on what is needed, process, tools, et cetera, to complete a project or streamline a process. So how, how do you, when do you know you're in the drama zone versus communication zone? So I'm gonna try not to dodge that question, but I'll go you know, right at it. So the first thing that happens when I present sometimes, especially with physicians and some really smart people and not just going out with physicians, is I'll have a whole presentation to go into what the sources of drama are and we can't get past the first slide. It's like, how'd you define that? Give me the case studies, let's go deeper into that. I'm like, or I could just present in a couple more hours and you'll have it. Mm. So I look at the rest of the audience and they're looking at me like, see what the issue is? Mm -hmm. So we can't get past slide one because, so we're stuck on, so that's one thing. The other thing is we don't, um, all of our stuff's like our book, No Ego, has this all the research in there. So a lot of times I just go to a person asking that and I say, you could read this book and what do you think happens? They don't take the book. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going at whoever asked this. Now, the other way that we had defined it, there's five sources of drama. Some is the loud drama, venting, tattling, scorekeeping, comparison. That's ego. Then lack of accountability is a little bit more loud. And then the two silent ones that are huge in CPA firms right now is um, lack of alignment to their organization and resistance to change. So a lot of people say yes in the meeting, and then the meeting after the meeting, they're like, I don't agree with that. I'm not following that process. I'll never do that. So it's that lack of alignment and um, is a big one, and then resisting change. And even yesterday, we were in the booth talking to some of the practitioners, a person who, you know, great self-awareness saying, yeah, I was creating the drama. It was just complaining and, you know, whining about other things that were going on in the organization, which clearly wasn't communication. Mm -hmm. So we've got some other interesting questions here with, you know, the, the hybrid workforce and high performers giving them quote unquote, increased benefits. Is this something that's gonna create, you know, lawsuits, this discrimination lawsuit, you're treating one person one way and someone else another way? So that's, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge in there. And again, always consult with HR and all these things, but you just wanna think about this North Star. And so people are like, we can't differentiate, but we differentiate all the time. When we hire, when we promote, when we um, put in high performing programs, um, and so what we always say, like one time I got accused of playing favorites as a leader and my response was, heck yes I do, do you wanna be one? <laughs> and I clarified, I don't play favorites based on anything illegal, immoral, unethical, um, you know, who you choose to believe in, color of your skin, all that stuff is so needed right now. We need that, um, those diverse views. But I do play favorites on some evidence-based good mental processes. Are you personally accountable? Um, do you understand your ego? Are you aligned to our organization that pays you a paycheck? And are you saying yes to what's next for what our customers need, our clients need? If you can do those four or five things, you're one of my favorites. Now, the funny thing about that when you have your non-negotiables in your leadership philosophy is someone in a low state of accountability, more of a helpless mindset looks at that. They're like, that's a lot of work. I don't want to do all that. And I go, that's fine. I'll be here with my favorites. Two weeks later, they want to be involved. I go, awesome, welcome back to the team. We want everyone here. Oh, but the other group's doing this. Do you want to follow these just five non-negotiables? Be nice to people and say yes to the organization that pays you. They're like, no, that looks like a lot of work. I go, all right, I'll be with the favorites. So the differentiation is on accountability level, which is open to everyone based on their background. Well, Barry, to bring, bring you in on this, I think I, you, what you just said, I think, is, is very accurate. You need to have a, a different mindset today. I mean, the, working remotely is something that you have to be skilled to do. So if the skills aren't there and they need more supervision, they need to be in the office. And I think that's something that, you know, it's, it's not, a, it's, so it's, it's not really different benefits. It's you, you need to find where people can work effectively. Well, well, and then, oh, go ahead, was it Barry? No, no, go ahead, you answer that, I'll ask you. A so some question. people are like, well, I gotta get you back in the office to see you. And I'm, I, what I would work on that leader with is how can you get more skillful given your goal is to better monitor your teams? So a lot of times that's, I would pull everyone to answer the call to greatness. So a lot of times a lot of speakers wanted to get back in person so people would listen to us. And I'm like, they're on their phones anyway, you can't control that. So you're gonna bring them back to the office thinking that you have more control of what's going on. I would work on getting more skillful in how I lead remotely 
and so that's the call to greatness to leaders. And then you, again, with your teams, it's, it's also calling them up to say, if we're having a lack of a communication issue, think inside the box. I wanna increase communication. Some are gonna be home, some are in, some are on leave, some aren't, and we find compromises in the box. And that's our action steps. Go it, ahead, it's, Barry. It's back to work for a purpose, is what, uh -huh. you, is what you're describing, and I think a lot of people are trying to gravitate to that. Just on your notion when you were talking about, uh, you know, a, sort of a, a group of people and in the drama, you know, those with drama, do they really help produce, and are they, you know, are the people that you, yeah, you can afford to lose them is the concept, <laughs> right? But, but you also talk about the notion of um, a person's potential in that process as well. And that's, that's part of the sort of the art of this process as well, would you say? Yeah. So, and I think that's pretty important in CPA firms because it, we tend to look at people from a technical mindset and maybe with whatever drama they bring, but we have to also look at their opportunities because, and mm -hmm. I know Lisa has heard this, where firms say, well, I don't have anybody who can do this, but a person who could do that, you know, was sort of viewed as maybe not as productive on a technical part, but they weren't given the pathway to really be the producer of something else that was needed in the future. Yeah, yeah, I, I love, sometimes it's redesigning our systems for pathways, as you said, but in our second book, and this is all the research in there, we measure value differently. It's your current performance, plus your readiness for what's next, uh, future potential, minus your drama quotient, and everyone has a drama factor, um, and it's three times the negative in our research. So let's say you have a rock star, but then they resist all change, they're hard to work with, and they don't fall into your systems. I would do the math differently, and that person that always is one of your best performers might be like a negative three in our assessment, because we need people more moving towards using our system standardization. So it's a way to measure and actually get the true value of someone's work, um, not just performance. And so the call to greatness for someone that's a high performer but not um, fluent in those low drama competencies is let's just get you f more fluent in those. It doesn't mean you're drama, it just means we're lacking fluency. So we do that full equation, but it's a surprise when people see that drama has a three times negative. 68% uh, uh, yeah, of high performers come out a negative number when they go through that assessment the first time. Wow. Yeah, but it's important, it's a three times negative, but also the, the the potential is also a factor in that. Not to get too into the math, future potential was a 1.5 multiplier, but it, the math got too wild. <laughs> so we, we keep it simple with just the drama piece. So that's the, and, yeah. and, and one well, last. We can handle wild math. Yeah, it's that's okay. what this yeah, we can say that here. What, one last point, a partner accountability is always a big, a big question, depending on as, even if it's a relatively small firm and certainly as firms go up. And, and clearly, if you're sort of instituting the theory and the work that you that you that you talk to, um, there's going to be perform there's going to be partner level that has some of the drama associated with it. Any advice on that point? So the first part is we have to define accountability. We've gotten way away from the definition. Um, there's locus of control in psychology is a very um, very research based look at accountability. And if you have an internal locus of control, you believe you can have impact in the world. If you have an external locus of control, you often think you're at the mercy of your circumstances. Which do you want in your firm? Mm. Internal, high accountables. So all of our factors that we measure are, there are four factors based on internal locus of control. So we sprinkle these into surveys so we can turn up the volume of what high accountables want. So it changes everything, like glass door. People don't like, you. they leave the firm and they rate you bad on glass door. I'm like, is that the high accountables or the low accountables saying that? Yeah. So it really changes everything. It's a big conversation to have, but um, everyone has a part to play. It's shared accountability. So if I'm thinking my partner's the issue, um, a, a leader, I need to say, given I have a less than stellar leader right there, and my goal is this, how can I update my skills to be able to impact that? And then the last thing I often say is if there's drama in your area, you either inherited it or hired it, you enable it or you are it. Yeah. So there those you are go. The three places to look. And so if you're like, we don't really inherit it, we're not hiring it, we're not enabling it, oh dang, I think I am it. So that's what I would do if I need to you go manage up or down. So well, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Lisa. We're gonna pivot to the open forum. But before we do, I mean, just what you heard here, we try to bring in, you know, true subject matter experts, leaders in their field to kind of talk about strategies and capabilities. And this here, this slide here, we show it at the opening of many town halls. 
What we try to do is give you the best available information. We try to interpret it. And then we have these other segments where we talk about technology, we talk about growth strategies, we talk about where the economy is going, and we just had this leadership segment. So we really worked hard to kind of have a multi-segment approach here to the town hall. We get great feedback. Some people like Barry one section more than the others, but the combination is, is, seems to be quite powerful and working. So let's now move into open forum. Lisa, uh, and that's one thing. Sometimes people accuse me of being on my phone. I'm not on my phone. I've got questions coming in many different places, okay? I am 100% on the town hall during the town hall. Uh, so first off, Lisa, there's this question. Here's a you know, more, of, you know, give it more of a technical question about the IRS um, and what, what happened with the disaster areas in California, uh, Alabama, and Georgia. And they said they were pushing out um, uh, some of the filing deadlines, but there's there's notices that are being sent out, and what's what's the AICPA? How, are we are we actively kind of getting that word to the IRS? Um, as I do with all of the town hall questions, we will accumulate these and get them over to our um, tax practice and ethics team and our our DC advocacy team. So thank you for that insight, and we'll we'll share those with the team so they can follow up. So, I also got a question about. Is ERC impacted by anything that was in the um, debt limit bill? And the answer is no. They clawed back unused COVID relief funds, but that was more of the funding that went to state and local governments, not, um, not putting a limit on the employee retention credit. Yeah, the, the real impact on that to practitioners in different states is, is that's clawed back. That changes the budget situation in state and local government which could have an implication to tax strategies, et cetera, in a particular state. So Kimberly, I want to bring you in to just kind of combining some of the leadership discussion with your innovation. So thoughts? So I think that what you pointed out around talent is a key point, especially now for us, because I know we're looking everywhere. But if we innovate around the experience in a way that is low drama, because if it's easier to stay home and be not in drama, people will do it. And so I believe if we're looking for people, if we truly are a great place to work with a great culture that's inclusive, I think we will have a competitive advantage and people will find out through word of mouth. You don't even have to advertise on any of these um, sites because people will start to come, especially when you go to universities. And the young people today, they want the gig economy. They want entrepreneurship and innovation. I think if everyone is an idea leader inside your organization, you can take advantage of that talent, those perspectives, and use everyone in the organization as a catalyst for strategy and change. And then you start leveraging the technology, AI, RPA, blockchain, um, definitely cyber everywhere, all the time, data privacy, analytics. I love the technology, but I know at the same time that we have to pay attention to the strategy. And fortunately, there are so many great vendors here on site yeah. that many of them are giving me ideas. And I love that we can challenge each other and say, what about this and what about that? So if everyone here hasn't been over to the exhibit hall, definitely get over there. And if you're online, you can do the exhibit lobby online as well if you are a member of the Engage uh, conference. Yeah, well said. I mean, we, we've spent a lot of time talking about innovation and leadership strategies, uh, but the, the technology capabilities are truly just transforming the, the client advisory services area, the tax area, a lot, lot going on in the audit area. So plenty for us to discuss in a, in a future town hall. So. This has been a, a great discussion, Kimberly, with both you and Alex. Um, one, we've got a lot of questions, Alex, on some of the, the, the different points you highlighted. We're going to take those questions. We'll, we'll be giving you some additional information in the newsletter. And one thing we're looking to do is to have an ongoing leadership uh, segment with Alex. So you'll, you'll see Alex back again. So thanks for your re reality-based leadership uh, thinking. Here. Thank you. Thank you. It's amazing. So with that, we've got a, a couple of resources uh, that we want to highlight. Then we'll have some closing remarks. Elisa? As Barry likes to call this, is my shameless plug um, to beg you to participate in the um, PCPS benchmarking survey. 
It is the largest benchmarking survey in the profession and um, lots of, of KPIs that our practitioner members have told us they're interested in. PCPS members who participate also get access to this incredible platform that lets you slice and dice data in thousands of different ways. And um, if you do participate, you also get a, a personalized report with your results against um, your, your peers. So again, survey closes June 30, and I've given you some uh, email addresses to look for so that you can go track that down, and, and we really would appreciate it if you would participate. It takes a village. Thanks, Lisa. And here's another you know, resource uh, slide. There's so much going on related to client advisory services. I'm talking to so many firms here at Engage about it, and many firms right now are saying, I'm going to stop and rethink how I'm going about this service line. And that's ex the exactly right, right question to be asking, to do a self-assessment. We just talked about kind of a leadership self-assessment. Do a self-assessment of, of your CAS line. Look at how other firms are bu building success. We've got a lot of case studies, a lot of information that can help you accelerate and just jump forward. So we want to encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, he here's uh, today's uh, highlights. Plenty discussed um, coming up. We've got the next town hall on, on June 22nd, and then the next one after that, July 13th. But here, closing out, Barry and Lisa, uh, the 100th episode. We've got 9,000 people uh, with us today, and it's not even our normal Thursday at 3 p.m. So thank you. Uh, it's dynamic. We've got, we've got these questions that came in today, which we're going to learn from. Um, we really work hard. We're going to at putting these town halls on. What you'll see here at the very end is a list of the village that puts this town hall on every couple of weeks. So we wanted to highlight what they've done. It's not just the three of us and our guests. It's all the people behind the scenes. So, so Lisa, some final reflections from you. Um, it, just a, a huge thank you to you and Barry and, and Mark for giving me this opportunity when I raised my hand and said yes. I had no idea what I was signing up for, um, but I was, I was ready for what was next, and, and I'm so thankful for the opportunity to connect with all of you on this regular basis. And we've got Mark Kozjul out in the audience. That's the Mark she's referring to. We have to thank Mark Peterson and his advocacy team as well. Yeah, Mar Mark was one of those that left us, but he was a high performer, to quote <laughs> Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Tough turnover. <laughs> Tough turnover. Um, yeah, I, I want to thank all the participants and the feedback that you give us and all these questions, the 50,000 questions. Um, I, it has made us better, and we constantly want to be better, make, you know, be, create more value to your membership and, and what's happening in the profession. So that's, that's just sort of at the top of the list. Uh, I do want to publicly thank Eric's passion for all of this. Um, and he, is, he has made a lot of personal commitments and sacrifices uh, to, to be in this spot. We do pinch hit for him sometimes, but not too often. And we have a wonderful team. You're going to see some highlight on that here in a moment that have made this happen. But um, it's, a, it's a big commitment. 100 is, is a big, significant milestone. We appreciate everyone being here physically at our Engage conference doing this, but also the 9,000 plus online. Well, Lisa, I want to thank you for your partnership. Lisa Simpson's been amazing. There's no question. Lisa gets the, the, the most call-outs here every, every couple of weeks in, in the uh, Q&A. So with that, thank you for today, and let's roll the final tape.